Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the Nature and Arts Club. I just want to thank uh, especially Anne Sheldon for inviting me to speak today. All right, but you can turn your hearing aids up too. <laughs> All right, so what I want to start with is just to say this is Nature and Art Club, and I'm going to do a little bit of both, but first I want to start with art. And when I say art, like by a show of hands, this first thought is movies. So, so nobody, but me neither. I think of paintings and sculptures and the like. So when I'm asked to do this, the first thing that popped into my head was a movie I did about nature. So I will be showing that movie later. But Annie told me that I could talk about filmmaking as an art. And I hadn't really given that a lot of thought. I hadn't thought about, is, is, make, is our movies an art form? And, but as you know, I thought about it some more as a filmmaker. Yeah, I think movies are an art form. But just to make sure, I looked it up in the Random House on the Dictionary, which says, in part, art is the quality, production, expression, or realm of things that conform to accepted aesthetic principles of beauty, show imagination and skill, and have more than ordinary meaning and importance. I mean, wow, art sounds hard. <laughs> Do movies do this? I, I think so. So, but let's start with the thing that pops into your head first probably, which is either uh, some sort of a still picture, like a painting or a photograph or something. And the saying goes, a picture tells a thousand words. By that metric, you could do war and peace with 587 pictures. So movies, on the other hand, by modern standards, take pictures at a rate of 24 frames a second. So and by frame, I mean a still photograph. And as you're probably aware, when we look at movies, each is they show a still picture, and then they show another one that's slightly different right after that one. And when, when you see one right after the other real quick, it looks like a movement. So the whole thing is sort of a uh, optical illusion of, of sorts. So by the time you watch the basic two-hour movie, you have looked at 172,800 photographs. So, a thousand words. A lot of pictures I've seen only say one word, crap. But you've ever gone into a museum or an art gallery, maybe you've had the experience of stopping and staring at a picture or a sculpture or something that really spoke to you. I mean, this, this happened to me. The first time this actually happened to me was when I was a teenager, and I went to the Hirschhorn Museum, which is the Museum of Modern Art as part of the Smithsonian Complex in Washington. And there I stood in front of a picture by Salvador Dali, which, not one of his super famous pictures, as far as I know, it wasn't an open class or anything like that. It was a picture where, when I stood right in front of this thing, I saw a bunch of people dressed in white robes and some caves and things like this. The, the kind of weird stuff they painted, but I thought it was cool. And then I stepped back about two steps and I saw a skull. You know, and I'm, I'm like 17 years old, and this was really, this really was telling me a story. Okay, so what we're saying here is that a photo, or a still, or any kind of other artwork, in a way, is a storytelling device. You know, if a picture has a thousand words, a thousand words is a short story, okay? So, the most important thing in movie making, or any art for that matter, at least in my humble opinion, is story. So we've all sat through movies and been amazed, and we've all sat through movies that were absolutely crap. 
as I mentioned before. So, what is the biggest single factor in whether or not we love the movie? Not, I mean, there's a lot of different factors, but what's the biggest single one? And, and I say storytelling. And storytelling is not random, like you might think. It isn't like somebody thinks up something and just says it off the top of their head. It takes a lot of work. Every good story, at least in movies, follows a formula. Don't believe me? But let's see what Hollywood thought about this. In Hollywood, they, they are making movies, of course, as a business. It's the entertainment business, but they gotta make money. And what they were finding out was, 19 out of 20 studio movies were not making any money. 19 out of 20 were either losing money, breaking even, or barely making any money. It was that 20th movie that was a blockbuster that got, that kept the studios going and let them keep doing their work and making profits. And that's fine. But studios are making their, their studios are making their living on the 20th movie, so, and that's 5% of their movies. So somebody decided to study it and find out if there was a secret. But the question is, once you know this secret, if there is one, is that going to spoil movies for you? Like if I tell you the secret right now, is that going to spoil movies for you? And I say quite the opposite. I say knowing the secret to movies or knowing the basic formula to a story doesn't, doesn't give you any more um, spoilage than knowing the rules to your favorite sport. Right? The better you know it, it doesn't tell you what's going to happen during the game but you kind of really understand what's happening during this game, or, or any other thing, or it could be music, whatever it is. In fact, I think that knowing all these things will enhance the experience for you. It certainly has for me. So anyway, getting back to Hollywood, they looked at literally thousands of blockbuster movies to see if these movies had anything in common. You know, what was that certain something? And sure enough, they found a set of characteristics, a set of traits that every one of these movies had. Every one of these 20 movies. And they looked at any movies that, that just barely made money. They looked at only the movies that made loads and loads of money, the ones that everyone wanted to come see, the ones that were popular. These movies all had a set of characteristics in common. So now, they kind of have the secret. But I want to emphasize here that this codification, if you will, is not a gimmick. It is a list of traits that make people understand and appreciate the art of filming. So if you're, if you're, I'm not going to go into a lot of this stuff right now, because that could be a whole talk on its own for like a couple of sessions. But if you're interested in seeing what, what all these different rules are, there is a book that was written in 1979 by a guy named Sid Field called Screenplay, Foundations of Screenwriting. And in this book, he goes into detail about what all these things were that they discovered about the best movies that have been made. And, and just to make sure that we're clear on this, when they looked at the other 19 movies that weren't big block, blockbusters, almost all of them had at least a couple of these different characteristics missing. Okay, so it was, it's almost a scientific thing that they did there. You know, they're trying to make money, they want to get more than one out of 20 movies to do. And the main, the main thing in storytelling, as Sid Field talks about, is the three act setup for, for um, screenwriting. But this is also something that goes all the way back to even William Shakespeare. These guys just instinctively knew that you had to, that you had sort of three different things that you got to do to tell the story in a way that not only will your audience understand it, but they're also going to be able to enjoy it. You know, really get into the story, see what they want to see, and, and walk away from the story having been fully entertained. And I just say to me, well, okay, you know, I go to plays all the time, 
and I see three act plays, and they shut down the whole thing at the end of each act. But I never see that happen in a movie. The movie starts, goes all the way through, and then you see the credits, and it's over. Okay, so, but the fact of the matter is, in the writing of the screenplays for these movies, they do work on a, on a three act sort of structure. And the three acts basically, according to the field, are setup, competition, and resolution. Basically, you meet you're in the first act, you meet with your main character, and find out what your main your protagonist's life is like. You know, and then something happens, a big, a big twist of the plot, and this particular protagonist has to go on some kind of journey, he has to solve some sort of problem. Okay, in the second act, the protagonist spends all kinds of time trying to figure out what to do and coming up with plans, the plans all fail. And so finally, by the end of Act 2, something really horrible happens. And I'm, I'm telling you, you watch movies now, and the second act ends three quarters of the way through the movie. Three quarters of the way through the movie, something bad's gonna happen. I'm sorry for the spoiler alert, but a lot of times it's somebody dying, or a really huge concept getting blown up and found out to be incorrect or something like that. The example that I really love is, if you've ever seen the original Star Wars movie, three quarters of the way through that movie, Darth Vader kills Obi-Wan Kenobi. And it's just, when I, I was 18 years old or 17 years old when this movie came out, and I'm watching Obi-Wan Kenobi get killed, and I'm like, oh my god, how did they do that? They're ruining the movie. You know, what's going to happen now? Who's going to train Luke Skywalker and all this kind of stuff? If you've never seen the movie, you don't know what the hell I'm talking about, but, you know, it, this happens in, in lots of different movies. And it turns out that it was really an important thing to have happen, you know? The, the, the protagonist of the movie, Luke Skywalker, kind of needed to have that wake-up call. You know, he was, he was sort of drifting through life and not really taking it quite as seriously as you need to take it, you need to come up with a new plan. And we won't go into all of that, but this is what happens. Act 3 happens, the protagonist regroups, comes up with a new plan. It's different from everything else they've tried before. And they, and they have a, a big climax, and maybe have a big fight with a big boss at the end. And then, at the very end of the movie, we see the result of the journey that the protagonist has gone on and how it has changed their life different from the very beginning of the movie where we saw what, what, they, what it was like for them prior to having this original problem happen. And that's the way these stories are generally told, at least in big blockbuster movies and most movies you see. If, if you don't see that type of structure in a movie, you're probably watching some sort of experimental or avant-garde movie, and, and these are things that some people really love, and hey, you never make money. All right, so let's get back to my stuff. I wanted to show you a movie that, had, that kind of hits the nature part of um, the ancient arts club. So I made this movie in 2017, no, 2019, when we went on a trip to the Galapagos Islands. I figured, okay, I'm going to bring a camera with me. I'm a filmmaker. I'm going to shoot some of these animals that you can't see anywhere else in the face of the earth and see what happens. So, before I talk any more about the movie, let's watch it.
I shot that entire movie on this camera. Okay, so when we went there, I didn't want to bring the camera, for instance, that we're using in the back that my camera operator, Christy Ballou, is shooting me with because I didn't want to have to carry something around. So I wanted something like could slip into my pocket, but I needed a pretty big camera. And this is a, a Panasonic it's a pretty good camera, I forget the exact model game and all that kind of stuff, but it really got the job done, I think, as far as shooting the movie went. Totally kind of science. So, with all my other cameras are cannons. This, the, you know, I can put this on my belt and slip this in here and walk around, and then whenever something interesting happened, I could shoot it. One of the things I was trying to do when making this movie is. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, I got you know, hours and hours and hours and hours of footage of all these animals and stuff. And, you know, I, I, we were there for a couple of weeks and I saw so much of it, you start getting used to it and thinking it's really, maybe it's not that interesting at all. I don't know. But I decided to try to cut it together in kind of a story. I don't know if it really tells a story, but I picked Vivaldi's um, spring from the Four Seasons to use as the background, and also because I could get that without having to pay royalties. <laughs> and it, it, it kind of let me arrange everything in a, in a three act um, structure. So it's definitely not the kind of movie I usually make. Okay? Usually, I make what we call narrative films, which are your basic stories. So, and then most, most of my, all, all of my movies are shorts. So what I'm going to show you now is a short comedy I made right at the very beginning of the COVID pandemic called Telekinesis for Beginners. And this movie was written by a friend of mine, but I produced it, shot it, and edited it, directed it, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm actually the filmmaker on it. This friend of mine, he wrote it, and he also did some of the music. I did some, and another guy did some. So let's watch that, and I'll talk about that one for a couple of minutes, and then we'll move on from there.
Note that this movie did, had no dialogue. In fact, they only had, well, effectively one actor, not counting the delivery guy. So, it still told the story to me. I mean, I didn't write it, like I said, but I produced it, directed it, and it. And I liked the story because <clears throat> it would be easy to shoot, especially considering the constraints that we had at the time. So, let me just. You, you could probably maybe have seen, if you were really looking for it, the three-act structure in that. In the beginning, you saw the guy you know, get his morning coffee and just being a neat freak about things. And then he gets his newest and latest how, how, you, how to do a book on how to do telekinesis. And he tries it, and the thing he's trying to move doesn't work, doesn't move, but everything else in, in the apartment does. And he tries it over and over, and the plan doesn't work. And in the end, he, the place is a mess, and he, he doesn't believe that he has successfully moved anything, so he orders a new book, and that's his final plan. Not the greatest, you know, three-act structure you've ever heard of, but that's, that's how that one worked, and hopefully it was kind of fun. And that, was, and that also introduced how it could be done with the comedy, because we think of the three act structure for dramas and horrors and science fiction movies and stuff. But it works, in, it happens in comedy too. At the three quarter mark, like I told you, something bad happens, or something really significant happens that's working against the protagonist. Okay, enough about the stories. I'm here to do a little bit of show and tell because I am a filmmaker. I already showed you the little tiny camera I used to shoot the Galapagos Spring movie. And the camera that Christie is using in the back, I used to shoot the movie we just saw. And that's a, that's a Canon um, 
That's a Canon camera that is designed specifically for shooting movies. This little one that I showed you was specifically designed for taking still photographs. I'll show you another one that's like that. This camera here is Canon 5D Mark II. And I got this camera when I first started doing this stuff because it had come out a few years ago and it was a significant camera because digital you know, at that time was, was really starting to catch on and film was sort of on its way out. And this camera was the first camera that ever came out, which was, if you'll excuse me being a little bit nerdy, but for you photographers out there, this was the first full frame DSLR that could take movies. Okay, the first full frame DSLR that could take movies. And what that means is it has a really large sensor in it, it's a digital camera, it has a really large sensor in it, and it's an SLR a camera but you can make it take movies. And this camera was good enough that a lot of actual TV shows started buying this to shoot the TV shows with. The one that I remember in particular is House, which is a show about a doctor. I don't know if anybody ever watched that, but House was um, shot entirely with this camera. Okay. And I figured, well, it's actually kind of affordable. And I want to get one of these things because at least now I'll have a kind of professional level camera. Now the thing about it is it's not it's definitely designed as a stills camera. This camera is designed to take um, full frame still pictures that and I've done a lot of that with this camera, it takes gorgeous pictures and it also does a gorgeous job doing movies. I we did not shoot either of the two movies you just saw with this one, but I've done other movies with it. And I've also used the second camera from other movies. And the thing that's got kind of going against it is it only will shoot a movie for about, I don't know, 11 or 12 minutes at a time. And then you have to restart it. And for various technical reasons that I won't go into that boring, but that's how that's how this kind of camera works. So if you want to shoot something like sometimes I'm asked to go and shoot um, a performance of a play, for instance, and this play might be 90 minutes long without, without stop or, or two 45 minute um, acts. But a camera like this, I couldn't do it. Because if it stopped, then I'd have to start again and do a uh, breaking action. So, what do you want to do is you want to go move up from this. So I, re so I recently got one of these. This is a camera, a Canon C70, and it is a professional level filmmaking camera, okay? Um, that said, as, as far as professional level goes, this one is sort of entry level, but this one is not designed to take still pictures at all. This one is designed to make movies. And it's extremely powerful, it does some very, very beautiful stuff. And using this camera, when you're done shooting a movie, you can make it look like a Hollywood movie, which I really like. And it was, a little, it was you know, kind, of a, kind of affordable. I spent a little bit of, of extra money on a camera like this, but it wasn't like trying to get cameras that the real top level guys use in Hollywood. Like, um, there's a company called Ari, A R R I, and they make a camera called the Alexa. And I don't know what these things cost, probably a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars. And these cameras, when you don't buy them or rent them, these cameras, everybody, everybody else wants their pictures to look like the Ari Alexa or something at that level. All right. Let's see what else I've got? Uh, that's where my note says, well, I guess I'm done. But <laughs> if anybody wants to ask me any questions or anything, I'll be happy to try to, to answer some questions. Hey, just one sec. I can't see if I don't do this. Yes? I'd like to know what your background is. Have you had professional training? Okay, so, so the question is, what about me? How did I get into this? What, what, what is my background in this? So as Anne mentioned at the beginning, I've been doing it at this point for about 12 years. And at first when I started doing it, I was, um, 
interested in trying this out and I got together with a friend of mine who actually went to school for this and he, and he as soon as he got out of university with his filmmaking degree, he made a movie and the movie became a minor cult classic actually um, called Redneck Zombies, obviously it's a comedy. So, he, uh, <laughs> so I said, hey, help me make a movie, I want to do a movie. So, so um, I wrote a movie with another guy and, and this particular friend of mine helped me produce the movie. I didn't direct it, I didn't edit it or any of that stuff, he did, he did that, but we, we made this movie together and I really loved the whole process. So I decided, I really want to learn how to do this because I didn't like being on the set and not really know what was going on, you know? I mean, so I sat down and I read book after book after book. And then I went and started working at a nearby uh, TV production place called Arlington Independent Media. I lived in Arlington, Virginia at the time, which is right next to Washington, D.C., where I worked. And I was able to go to this place, which was actually within walking distance of where I lived, and learn how to do TV. And to even work there, you had to take classes and all kinds of stuff like that. And TV, by the way, has a lot of crossover with filmmaking. So I, I learned a lot, and I did that for several years, and I worked my way up, and I ended up working on at least 200 episodes of TV shows, and I directed probably about 50 of those before I stopped doing that. And meanwhile, I kept making short movies, and started, you know, got better and better at it, and learned how to do editing, and all the different stuff that you need to know to do movies. So that's kind of the short story of me being into this. Any, any other questions? What did you do before you started making movies? And before, what did I do before I started making Well, I was, um, why didn't I get into movies like my buddy did and go to school and get a degree in filmmaking and, and, make, and make a goofy movie that actually got distributed? Well, and the answer to that was, that thought never even crossed my mind. To be honest with you, I was kind of good at math and science, and I found out that if you go to school and you get a degree in engineering, it's pretty easy to get a good high paying job. So that's what I ended up doing, and I did that, as Ann mentioned at the beginning, for 31 years. I was an electronics engineer. And so this electronics engineering background sometimes comes in handy when you're doing a lot of this technical stuff, because I find it super easy to understand all, any kind of any kind of thing that's, that's technical, you know, when I'm doing any of this kind of um, work. Anybody else? My next movie. So right now I'm in the middle of making a movie. It's a comedy, and it's called A Silencer, A Funeral, and One French Fry. <laughs> So, and I'm, I'm glad you laughed because it's a comedy, so even the title's supposed to be funny. And uh, this movie is currently in production. We've shot about, I don't know, three quarters of it, maybe a little more. My camera operator on that movie is Christy, who's in the back way introduced before. And we still have to, to shoot a few more scenes before I can begin editing it in earnest. Meanwhile, I'm making a couple of other shorter, more, less complicated films as well. So this, this particular movie, when it's done, will probably be approximately 25 minutes. So it's on the relatively long side of the short movie. And it's the, probably the most complicated involved movie I've ever attempted to make. So learning a lot from doing this. Anyway, so that's, so that's what I'm doing. Next. I noticed that you came in as a semi-finalist for several uh, different events. Uh, a, did you get any uh, money out of it? Did you get any recognition? Where did it get you? And how do you keep on the out of it? Okay, so when, when I make a movie, First thing I want to do with it is, is put it into film festivals because that's really the only place that a short movie is going to get seen. 
you do sometimes see a few short movies, maybe on HBO or something, and, and a lot of streamers show them. But for the most part, when you make a movie, you know, you put it in a film festival. So this, the film festivals sometimes like the movie, and you get certain awards for it. And, and a couple of a couple of these two movies made semifinals, which doesn't really get you anything except like. I get to put the laurel on the front of the movie and it's sort of a resume for that movie. You know. But it's still an honor and I'll thank you. you know, these, these, these short films, you don't really expect to make any money or, or, or get too much recognition. But at some point, if I ever make a feature length film, then that's where the making money part of it comes in. And this short films can kind of be your resume for that, in a way. Okay? <laughs> what did the 1 in 20 blockbusters have in common? What did the 1 in 20 blockbusters have in common? Well, like I mentioned, that's, that's kind of a lot of stuff, and, you know, I could probably get up here and do the whole 45 minute talk on just that. So I wanted to sort of, um, Emphasize what I thought was the most important one, which was story and three act structure. But there's there was a number of other different things. And honestly, off the top of my head, I didn't really come prepared to to list them all for you. But if you are interested in exploring that, I definitely recommend reading the Sid Field book that I mentioned before. His first name is spelled S Y D. Sid Field. He was, he's really famous. He, he wrote books about movies and did lectures. And, and stuff like that. And the name of the, and just go on Amazon and type in screenplay, see it feel, and I promise you'll see it there. And it's, it's a fascinating book. did notice that I was, I was the delivery guy in that movie. I had a beard and a hat on, so I didn't know if anybody would recognize me. But there I was. So I used me as an actor. The other guy in that particular movie, Amadeo Falciatore, is has really become a friend of mine over the years. And he is a, uh, an actor who does a lot of work locally in theater, particularly. But also, you'll see this guy, if you look carefully, in um, commercials, and I think he does some industrials, and I know a lot of people like like that. So how do I meet these people? So when I got and when I was in Arlington, of course, I met a lot of actors through Arlington Independent Media where I was working. But when I got down here, I didn't know anybody, so I decided the first thing I'm going to do is they had a brand new film festival they were doing called Film the Brow, which later got subsumed into the Fort Lauderdale International Film Festival. So I went to film in Broward to see if I could meet some people and see what the local filmmakers were doing. Because like, like, like the name implies, these are all filmmakers from Broward County making movies right here in South Park. So I, I, who I met was a guy named Ed Costas, who, who also happens to be Christie's partner in life, and Ed and Christy run this organization called Act Broward, and Act stands for Actors Cultural Theater, and it's, but it's not just for actors, they invite um, filmmakers and people just in, in sort of the acting community at large to, to participate. So through them, I met a lot of actors, and a lot of these actors work in a lot of the local theater groups that you may even have gone and seen productions of, you know, Lauder, Lauderdale by the Sea, not your average theater group. There's a number of, at least, I don't even know how many there are, but there's a lot of these small theater groups just putting on shows and selling out their little theaters. So I've met a lot of actors that way, but the other way that you do it is, nowadays, like everything else, you go online. And there's places online where you can advertise your jobs. And I've gotten some very good actors from doing that, too. Can I just a little bit more 
Why did we start making money? Okay, so the 19 movies that didn't make any money, these things. Like I said, and it's, I guess it's a little bit harder to understand since I didn't, I didn't list all of the different traits that a big blockbuster movie has to have. But, and probably a few of these 19 movies here and there had all of these different traits and still didn't make money. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why a movie might not make money. But definitely, if you don't do all the things that Sid Field listed in his book, then you're highly unlikely to have a big blockbuster movie. Okay, so again, I, I don't, I, I didn't uh, prepare a list of all these different things for you, but I didn't really think I was going to get a lot of questions about it, to be honest with you. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's kind of the way that works. They, they do all the stuff that you're supposed to do to make a big blockbuster movie. And, honestly, you have to have, you know, a, a good story because you could do all these things and have not a very interesting story, and you're definitely not going to get a blockbuster movie out of that. I don't care if you spend $100 million on it. <laughs> so, I hope that is the question. Any, anyone else? Yes, and the question is, what about the older movies made before 1979 when Sid Field wrote his book, or before anybody even did studies on this? And these were the, they, those were the blockbuster movies that they studied. These movies like Casablanca that made, I don't even know kind of how, how, how uh, successful it was, but people studied all of those movies, and they all had the trait of people who made the movies just sort of instinctively knew what would work. But it looks like everyone's getting up and getting ready to go, so, so let's conclude now. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, and Sheldon, for inviting me.